Hello everyone, hope you're having a good day. My name is Devansh and I welcome you back to this channel. Today I'm here to present the pre-scene analysis part one of the strategic case study exam coming up in November 2022 and February 2023. So on this FinTutors channel, we post a lot of SEMA related important discussions and important analysis. So if you haven't already followed us, I welcome you to the page. I welcome you to this discussion and I'm sure you're going to find it helpful. So in this pre-scene analysis, we are going to discuss each and every part of the pre-scene that has been released by SEMA. So we'll take the actual SEMA document and we'll make our own annotations in a very innovative, in a very colorful way, because it has been proven by science that students remember better if they have images, if they have diagrams, if they have colors. So we try to make it in a way where things can stick with you. Things are easily rememberable for you. That's how we make our entire pre-scene and that's how all of our courses are set. So we'll read the pre-scene word by word line by line, explaining to you each part, explaining to you the nature of the business, the industry that the business works in, the system in which the production works, Ex everything will be explained by me while we make very important relations to your E3, P3 and F3 syllabus because that's also important, right? It's an exam. So we have to think of it from syllabus perspective as well. So at every stage, we'll be linking it to your E3, P3 and F3 syllabus areas, helping you identify possible exam scenarios, helping you identify important revision areas and important study areas. Now, before I move, move ahead, we have a very important resource available for you which is called the free mini course. So what we did was we have created a free course for students to help you understand the exact nature of the SCS exam, how you're supposed to study for the exam, what material you need to do well on this exam, how you have to approach answer writing, all of that we thought rather than giving it to you in one video, let's create a course which you can sign up to completely free. So we've created a free mini course. The link for the mini course is in the description below. You just have to click on it and you can access the mini course, which is packed with information. The mini course has introduction to the exam. It has a very detailed industry analysis, a blueprint explanation. It has answer writing tips, important syllabus areas, and it has a mock exam for you to try which will be personally marked for you if you write it. So the free mini course is packed full of information to give you a good start and give you great chance of doing well on this exam. It's absolutely free. There's nothing to lose. The link is in the description below. Simply click it. You can register for the mini course and access a whole bunch of material. So try out the mini course. That's my recommendation. Coming back to the pre-scene, let's start with analyzing the company and you'll see how easy it becomes when it's a little bit more interactive. So let's begin. The first thing that we look at is the introduction to our company. It is very important to follow each word of this pre-scene analysis because obviously we don't want to miss anything while learning, while understanding something new about our company. Because as we know, the pre-scene is the second most important pillar of this exam. So there are three pillars of this exam, all have equal importance. First one being your revision, second one being the pre-scene, third one being mock writing. We're now on, we're rather discussing now the pre-scene pillar. So let's make sure everything is followed. As we know, the company that's been given to us is called Hot Air. However, you want to pronounce it, the name that they have given or the spelling that they have given us is H-O-T-T-A-Y-R. And it's a quoted company that manufactures domestic heating products, mainly gas boilers and air source heat pumps. So very important for us to keep in mind over here that we are a quoted company and we are a manufacturing organization. Now, after a very long period of time in the strategic case study exam, 
SEMA have chosen to give a manufacturing organization. They've always, in the past year and a half or two, they've always given, uh, you know, service-oriented businesses. This is the first time a manufacturing organization has been given. So it opens up a whole variety of different manufacturing-related questions or topics which can be tested. And throughout the entire pre-scene, you'll see text boxes like these blue ones, which will give you my insight, which will give you my explanation. And then we'll always relate it to your E3, P3 and F3 syllabus, making sure that important topics and relevant syllabus areas are pointed out for you. So whenever I see something new, something interesting, I'll make a text box and I'll give you some pointers, I'll give you some insights for you to think as well. So over here, I saw something interesting in the word quoted company. Now, because we are a quoted company, always important on the onset to keep in our mind that there we are listed on the stock exchange and there will be a couple advantages, few disadvantages of being a listed company. The advantages are you have access to capital for growth, so you can raise finance easily if needed. Your company has good visibility because it's listed on the stock exchange. The disadvantages would be the huge amount of uh, reporting requirements, the enhanced government scrutiny, shareholder scrutiny, stakeholder scrutiny, which organizations come under. So let me keep in mind from the onset that we are a quoted company and we are a company that manufactures domestic heating products. Now I've spoken about the entire industry of domestic heating products in my industry analysis video. So if you've not viewed it, that's the first thing that you should view. It will give you a great start to understanding the case study world or rather the world of domestic heating products. Now also, since we are a listed company, it will be important to present profitability ratios, lender ratios, investor ratios properly as shareholders and the market as a whole will read into the same and judge the company. When you are looking at a company's performance, you'll obviously look at its profitability ratios, lender ratios, gearing, its investor ratios, like the dividend that it paid, the earnings per share. All of this will be something which is important and all of this is part of your F3 chapter number one and it's an important syllabus area, that's why I have mentioned it. Now, throughout the pre-scene, I'll keep mentioning important aspects and important areas which are good to keep in mind and good to revise as we move deeper into the pre-scene. Let's keep on. So important factors to consider for a manufacturing organization. Any manufacturing organization in the world will have to look and have to judge the demand for their product. We'll have to look at the competition from others. We'll have to look at their previous experience, their knowledge, their qualifications and their technological investments. Finance available, you obviously have to look at that. And the rules and regulations which have to be followed specifically in such a customer oriented business like ours, which is domestic heating. So rules and regulations will be strict, which need to be followed. And for as for any manufacturing organization, this is true for hot air as well. So from the onset, giving you ideas and putting you into the zone to question yourself as we go deeper into the pre-scene. At every step, this is what I'll be doing and this is going to be our method of learning. Keeping it simple, easy, yet very candid and sticking to the important aspects and not doing any over analysis. That's also very important. Let's continue. You have been given the role of a senior manager in Hot Air's finance function. They tell you that you are a senior manager. Just think, what does a senior manager have to do? In your organization, what do you think a senior manager has to do? He'll have to lay out the decisions which kind of define the company, which kind of help the company set its strategies. So as a senior manager, you need to look at long-term strategic issues looking into the future. 
and your audience is going to be the board of directors is going to be maybe one of the board of directors or all of the board of directors that you may be presenting something to so to give a satisfactory answer understanding the full cycle and the full scale of your business is very important have you seen any senior finance manager who doesn't know what their company does it would be a ve- not a very good place to be in right so the first place to be a good senior manager is to know your company that's what we are doing through this pre scene and with this detailed analysis that we make for you so your role as a senior manager would include a long term focus in everything product related decision support diversification related decision support so strategic decisions anything related to a project management and risk management advising your top management managing stakeholders and if you look at all of this roughly if i look at all of this as an umbrella i will see that all of the above points correspond to the blueprint areas or the core areas which are set out by sema and are eventually part of your e3 p3 and f3 syllabus so if you're doing your revision and when students have signed up with us and they're following my study notes my instructions and when you're doing this revision you are automatically putting yourself in a good position to become a good senior finance manager so this is just to point out the importance of revision again you report directly to the board and advise on special projects and strategic matters so the word strategy is coming over here and everything related to strategy formation strategy creation is part of your e3 syllabus in the uh, primary chapters so again important for me to mention important for me to just bring up for you moving on hot air is based in norland which is a developed country that has an active and well regulated stock exchange i see something important again they tell me that i am based in norland it's a country that has an active and well regulated stock exchange but the important word here is developed country it's a developed nation so you can think of it as you know one of the countries in north america like the usa you can think of it as some of the countries in europe which are in the developed nations category why i'm making a comparison and why i'm mentioning these countries is because you now can think of norland as a nation that is developed where people will have the money the power and there will be lots of buyer potential as well because in developed countries generally the gdp and the per capita income of every person is higher than that of a developing nation or a nation that's on the lower scale of the developing nations chart so norland is a developed country which clearly tells me that i am in a country where people will have the power people will have the interest to buy the goods that i offer so this tells us that the demand conditions in this country are going to be good are going to be strong and when i speak about demand conditions it takes me to the porter's diamond in my e3 syllabus again an important uh, aspect for me to mention and that is why i've got it up so what do we learn from this from this we learn that when the demand conditions are high and when i am situated in a high developed economy it means that people will have the interest and the disposable income to spend on innovative and sophisticated products that my company manufactures which is heating equipment and in my industry analysis as well we've learned that this is a sophisticated system which can turn out to be expensive so in a developed nation it's more likely to succeed and i'm already situated in a developed country which is kind of a comparative advantage for hot air right so the focus areas have to be developed or fast developing nations which we have spoken about in the industry analysis norland's currency is the n dollars norland requires companies to prepare their financial statements in accordance with the ifrs 
now they're telling us about the domestic central heating systems so they're giving us some background on what domestic central heating systems are those who've done my industry analysis already know a little bit of the background of this industry a little bit of the trends the opportunities in this industry and you can bring that knowledge forward now detail has been given to you of the industry as part of this pre-scene which we'll go through together and it will make more sense to you so domestic central heating systems different systems are spoken about we'll go through them one by one heating systems are necessary to keep rooms at comfortable temperatures and to prevent dampness caused by condensation pretty standard most dwellings in countries that have cold weather for a significant part of the year have central heating systems I've spoken about this so this will be our focus market you'll have to focus on the market where there is going to be good demand so developed nations or highly developing nations along with nations that have cold weather for a significant part of the year will have to be your focus as discussed in the industry analysis india china japan have the fastest growth rates in this market while europe and north america still hold the largest market share so a good external market analysis will be very important to stay ahead in this market if you don't know where the demand is and if you can't capitalize it at the right on the right time or try to be a first mover try to diversify at the right time you may lose out a very very lucrative opportunity so when we are speaking about external market analysis your e3 syllabus of the porter's five forces or the pestel analysis which are tools to make a good external market analysis come into the picture so your e3 syllabus coming up as very prominent because e3 is the most important part of the strategic case study exam these use a central heat source such as a boiler or a heat pump to heat water that is then pumped around the dwelling in order to heat each room detail is going to be given about each method now the first method is traditional combustion based boilers gas boilers are popular in countries that have main gas usually natural gas piped to individual dwellings gas is an efficient fuel that is used to power central heating boilers for cooking and to heat water for bathing and cleaning as well a gas powered boiler is connected to the dwelling's gas and cold water supply the boiler heats water by burning gas the hot water is then either pumped around the dwelling to heat radiators or it can be used as hot water for your baths showers and washing it can used to be create heat in the house by pumping that hot water through the radiators or it can be used for your normal day to day uh, you know chores as well like baths showers and washing so the traditional based was combustion based boilers which were gas boilers which were based on natural gas which was piped to individual houses so where there is the availability of gas pipelines available to individual houses gas based boilers is something that was very common so like coal and oil based boilers coal based boilers wood based boilers natural gas comes from a depleting source that cannot be replenished over time and is thus referred to a non renewable resource natural gas is a non renewable resource it's not unlimited right this may be a very popular way of heating in developed countries like europe as well as developing nations but it has its environmental effects because it is not sustainable so ethics corporate social responsibility come into the picture here which is part of your e3 syllabus when we go deeper into the pre scene and when we start speaking about hot air and the type of products that hot air offers we'll see are we being socially responsible in our offering are we making sure that the products that we offer are not 
harming the environment excessively but that idea has been given to you now and we'll detail on it later so most com uh, countries impose strict regulations to ensure the safety of gas boilers because as you can imagine they're quite dangerous if they catch fire there's going to be a huge blast what i ask all my students to do throughout the entire pre scene have a list where you are writing down the major risks that our company faces you know let's look at the major areas or the major risks that the company faces and let's make a list of them because risk management risk identification is very important and is often a task in your scs exam so risk management the tara framework of risk management is something that we should know which is part of your p3 syllabus and keep making a list from now till the end of the pre scene and identify the kinds of risks that your organization and your market as a whole faces as simple as that so the boilers themselves must meet safety standards and they must be installed and maintained by qualified plumbers to ensure that there are no gas leaks you obviously you know don't want any calamity to occur domestic gas boilers are generally designed to have relatively little need for controls that require users to make any adjustments once they have been installed once they have been installed and switched on there's very little that you have to do so the chance of something going wrong is less but if it does it can be very very dangerous as we all know consumers must buy separate controllers that combine thermostats and clocks to manage the heat output and the availability of hot water thermostats can vary in sophistication from basic mechanical devices to electronic devices that can be operated by smartphones so the gas boilers only boil the water but you have to buy separate controllers to manage the output of the heat and the availability of hot water to understand how much hot water remains in the boiler and which you can use i've put an image over here just for you to see what a sophisticated thermostat would look like you know it's like a screen where you see uh, or you can set the temperature at to what level of hot water or heat output is being generated and you can also check the availability of hot water these controllers are very sophisticated and they are sometimes operated by smartphones as well so wifi connectivity and wireless connectivity i'll speak more about the digital aspect when we speak about hot air's products but let's just understand over here that controllers is also a component of the hvac market and it's also a big or growing segment now what is hvac if you've done my industry analysis you know it's heating ventilation and air conditioning market now heating is only one part of the hvac market heating is only one part and under this market there are controllers as well and there are different controller manufacturers as well so as we go deeper into the pre scene we want to understand our company's product portfolio do we only make heating equipment do we make heating controllers what we do we want to understand when we go deeper but let's now know this that controllers is also one component in the hvac market so this is an important revelation that we made here gas boilers can be powered using liquid petroleum gas lpg that is stored outdoors in a tank and piped into the dwellings as required so you can use lpg as well gas boilers can use lpg as well and a image of the same has been laid out for you over here everybody knows what an lpg cylinder looks like may look different in different countries but just a display has been put over here and uh, it's very clear that it needs to be piped into the dwelling as required dwelling means the house the tank is replenished by a tanker vehicle a tanker comes and replenishes this large tank some dwellings use oil fired boilers as well those require a similar arrangement to an lpg system with a tank containing heating oil 
located in the garden and an oil burning boiler used to heat water in the home. So you can have natural gas, LPG, you can have oil fired boilers as well. So this is also very traditional, but again, non-renewable oil again is not a renewable resource. It's something that harms the environment because of the combustion and the gases that it's and the carbon that it releases into the atmosphere. Next, we have wood burning stoves. Wood burning stoves can be used as a heat source for central heating systems. Householders burn logs that provide radiant heat within the room. You know, you have a fireplace or you have a wood burning stove. You burn the log, generate heat. Also, there are wood burning furnaces. Wood burning furnaces, on the other hand, are, or wood burning boilers have a square cut out in the middle where you put in the logs, you burn them, it generates heat. And there are pipes at the back of the stove which heat water that is then used to heat other rooms in the same manner as for gas and oil burning boilers. So you have your standard wood burning stoves as well. The wood that is burned in wood burning stoves is a renewable energy source, making them more environmentally friendly than gas or oil powered boilers. They're a little better than gas or oil powered, but still they're using wood, they're using trees. Nevertheless, all heat sources that rely on combustion release carbon into the atmosphere. Anything that you have to burn releases carbon into the atmosphere. As our industry is inherently criticized for being non-sustainable, you know, there since years oil powered, LPG powered, wood powered uh, boilers are being used. We must see what our company is doing to stand out. Are we also following the same traditional trend? Are we doing something new? Are we doing something innovative? This could be an area where we differentiate and set ourselves apart by a unique mission and vision, which we we'll learn when we go deeper into the pre-scene. They'll give us what the mission is, what the vision is. Our stance on corporate social responsibility will also be interesting to see when we start discussing about our company. So the mission, the vision, the CSR, all part of your E3 syllabus. Next topic is distributing heat around the home. Now a network of pipes made from either copper or plastic carries hot water from the boiler to each room in the dwelling that it has to be heated. Obviously there has to be a connection of pipes that carries the hot water or carries the steam to heat each room that has to be heated. So the most popular method of heating a room is to install one or more radiators. If you visited Europe or if anybody lives in Europe or North America for that matter, you'll see these kind of uh, structures next to windows or on walls. These are radiators out of which the hot steam comes out to heat your room. So radiators are metal pipes that are designed to transfer heat from the hot water that flows through them into the surrounding air. The release of heat energy warms the room, cooling the hot water in the process. So the release of heat energy warms the entire room. The water carries on through the pipes to the next radiator where further heat is released. It's an entire system, right? Central heating systems are designed to ensure that every room is heated to a satisfactory extent. Boilers come in different capacities, with more powerful boilers producing more hot water, which enables them to provide heat across larger houses. Now you may be wondering why are they telling all, all of this to me? Directly start by telling me about hot air? That's not how it works. Because to be a senior finance manager, you will need to know about the industry. You will need to know about the type of products which are in the market. And then they'll tell you the type of products which our company offers. Only then it makes sense. So right now they're only giving us background information. Right now they're only giving us industry information. What is available in the market? What the system in the market is with you know, this domestic heating products. That's what they're telling us. So don't think this is not important. This is very important for your case study exam. 
large radiators release more heat energy and so can heat a larger volume of air. The size of the radiator will define how much heat it can generate. So larger rooms require larger radiators or perhaps multiple radiators. You can have two radiators as well. Now radiators are usually fitted with thermostats, with controls. Those can be used to regulate the amount of heat that is released into any given room and so prevents uncomfortably high temperatures. So you can adjust the flow of heat from the radiator to make sure that it doesn't get too hot as well. So as we can see for our domestic heating products to work properly, they must be connected properly to thermostats and controllers. So it's a very, uh, you know, so, so it's a very connected process where everything has to come together to generate that heat. This will be an important consideration for us and thermostat producers, controller producers will be important stakeholders for us to be in connection with because remember you are a manufacturer of domestic heating equipment. You make only your air source heat pumps, you make boilers, you don't make thermostats, you don't make uh, controllers, they have not mentioned anything about that up until now. So they will be important stakeholders which you have to work with to make sure your component or the product that you manufacture is optimally used by the customer. So managing relationships with this stakeholder will be very important for our business. So relationship management, conflict management, conflict resolution from your E3 syllabus becomes very important. And also, is there a chance for vertical integration here? Is there a chance for me to start making controllers? Is for me to enter the controllers market? It could be kind of a related diversification, right? As we go to the financials, when we do the financial analysis, we look at the financials and see, is my company having a strong cash balance? Is there an opportunity for my company to expand over here? So vertical integration, let's keep it as an idea because you know, it can be profitable because that is also a large market. So let's pause for a moment here. Think about synergies that it could generate and think about drawbacks. I'll obviously discuss them for you. I'll obviously, uh, you know, be testing you on this kind of scenario as well when we go to mock questions. But right now I want you to think. Synergies are from the F3 syllabus. So yes, this is important. Is there a chance for vertical integration? I think there is. Up until now, we were speaking about overflow heating, which means radiators are next to walls, next to windows. You can see them. There is underfloor heating as well, which means the same system of pipes, but under the floor. So underfloor heating, is an alternative to radiators. If you don't want radiators, you can have underfloor heating. Hot water from the boiler is piped from room to room. There are pipes again. Plastic pipes are set into the concrete floor in a zigzag design that enables heat to be released. So the floor that you are walking on is heated, creating an even heat across the whole room and avoiding the need to install radiators on the walls of the room. The pipes are embedded in the floor and so they cannot be seen and they can be walked across without causing any damage. The floor can be covered with any conventional type of flooring, although carpets tend to act as an insulator and can reduce the effect of heat flow. Pretty standard information being given, but yes, this is another kind of heating, the heating system which you can have. Now to heat pumps. Remember in the first page, let me scroll right back up to the first page. They told us that we manufacture air source heat pumps and gas boilers. So mainly gas boilers and air source heat pumps are our focus. We spoke about boilers. We'll now speak about air source heat pumps. And what are heat pumps in general? Then we'll speak about the categories in heat pumps as well. Heat pumps can capture heat energy from a source and release it elsewhere. A very, I'll say a new development in this market. 
it was very traditional with your boilers and with your uh, wood boilers and with your uh, radiators it was quite uh, i'll say traditional the heat pumps was a new innovation and we'll speak about it so the heat pumps capture heat energy from a source and release it elsewhere the source may be cooler than the destination it just captures energy from a source and then it releases it elsewhere the entire application is now going to be uh, spoken about so let's start there are several different applications of this technology heat pumps are used in refrigerators they used in air conditioners and they are used in central heating systems as well refrigerators and freezers use heat pumps to capture heat energy from the interior of the appliance and move it to the exterior doing so reduces the temperature inside the appliance and so you get a cold feeling inside the refrigerator while from outside the refrigerator is generally hot if you touch the back side of the refrigerator you will find it to be hot because this is the technology if the heat pump was switched off then the higher temperature in the room would lead to heat energy flowing back into the cooler interior of the refrigerator or the freezer until it reached room temperature so if the heat pump is not working what happens inside the temperature your ice starts melting your food goes spoiled all of that happens if the heat pump is not working so the heat pump technology is used in refrigerators as well it's used in air conditioners as well with the same principle so air conditioners use the same principle to take heat energy from the room which is warm which is hot and then releases that heat outside the room becomes cooler and more comfortable while the device is in operation that's how an air conditioner works and heat pumps are used heat pumps are also used in central heating systems they can be used to capture heat energy that can be used in central heating systems heat energy is captured from the outside a building and is released inside to make the interior warmer heat pumps do not create heat energy they simply move it from one place to another the technology required to create an effective heat pump relies on a number of physical laws lots of physics so you may feel that i'm teaching you about science right now when we are learning for a management accounting course but to do well on the exam the nature of understanding your company is important remember they're telling us first they told us that we manufacture air source heat pumps okay so the heat pumps technology is something that we are accustomed with now they're telling us that heat pumps are used in refrigerators air conditioners and in central heating systems so if we are only focusing on central heating systems again is there an opportunity to start to manufacture slightly different heat pumps for air conditioners slightly different heat pumps for refrigerators and freezers it may be a completely different complementary line that opens up for our business that opens up as an opportunity for my business let's just keep this in mind i'm not saying we have to do it or we should do it but let's just keep this in mind as an opportunity because areas to grow uh, or rather strategies for growth is part of your e3 syllabus under the ansofs matrix so market development product development diversification strategies if we were to keep in mind while discussing this pre scene it could add value to the preparation for sure so let's keep this in mind how the heat pump works is a very very scientific design that has been put over here to explain to you the same the first step is an evaporator the evaporator where is where the refrigerant evaporates which captures heat energy from the outside air so captures heat energy from the outside air then it passes to the compressor the gas from the evaporator is compressed which increases its temperature it's compressed it increases its temperature once the temperature is increased the condenser comes into the picture this is where the refrigerant cools releasing your heat energy 
and the pressure on the refrigerant gas decreases, lowering its temperature still further and condensing it back to liquid. And that is why you will see in air conditioners or in heat pumps, there is always water droplets which you will find. This is the reason why. Because the pressure on the refrigerant gas decreases, lowering its temperature, condensing it back to liquid. So this is the, I'll say, method or I'll say the system by which your heat pumps work. And this is, for, this is given to you as a diagram first. Now you don't need to learn the diagram. You don't need to go into details of any part of the diagram. No, but this is just to give you further background and they've given it. So it's my job to explain it. Now the heat pumps rely on a volatile liquid called a refrigerant, which is trapped inside a pipe. So this exact same four steps that were mentioned as a diagram will now be explained to you in the format of words. So heat pumps rely on a volatile liquid called refrigerant. I have put it in a box for you with a color because it generally sticks better for students. Students remember something better when it's illustrated as a diagram, when it's illustrated as a, you know, just something that sticks to their memory. I don't want you to learn anything, but I'll want you to go through the pre-scene very many times till the date of your exam. So automatically you buy into the method, you buy into the system, you buy into what I'm teaching. Don't learn anything because that's not needed, but keep going through it multiple times. So you'll automatically remember the important parts and important areas. The refrigerant is pumped around the pipe in a continuous cycle. We already know that. The evaporator section one, is a section of pipe that has been twisted into a coil or a zigzag shape to increase its area. It is used to capture your heat energy. The heat pumps generally use hydrofluorocarbons as refrigerants. So chemical used as a refrigerant. These boil at very low temperatures, sometimes as low as minus 20 degrees Celsius. When the liquid boils, they evaporate into gas, which captures heat. So the heat pumps use hydrofluorocarbons as refrigerants. So the refrigerant is a chemical called hydrofluorocarbons. And it boils at very low temperatures, even at minus 20 degrees Celsius, it will boil and it will evaporate, it will create gas. The compressor increases the pressure of the gas, which further increases the temperature. It's compressed, right? So the refrigerant is now hot enough to be used as a heat source. It boils, becomes gas, then it's compressed, it's become hot, and now it will be used as the heat source. The condenser is a further coil or zigzag of piping that allows the refrigerant gas to cool and so release the heat energy. When hot meets cold, that's when an energy is released. In central heating systems, the condenser is used to heat water that can then be pumped to a hot water tank for washing or to radiators or under floor heating pipes as well. So if it's a central heating system, the pump is used to heat water that can then be pumped to a hot water tank for washing or to your radiators, or to your underfloor heating pipes. So the radiators, underfloor heating pipes, still used. But the method by which the heat is generated has changed vastly because now you're using heat pumps. The expansion valve reduces the pressure on the refrigerant gas. Decreasing the pressure cools the gas, which releases still more heat. The refrigerant can be returned to the evaporator as we have spoken about it in this diagram. So I don't want you to learn this entire system. I just want you to know what the four steps are and in your own words, just know how these four steps work. No extra detail, no scientific analysis is needed from your end. That is not the purpose of this pre-scene. That is not the purpose of uh, you know this exam. But knowing the basics will be important which I have explained to you. There is a constant flow of refrigerant throughout the heat pump. 
in the entire system throughout the four steps the refrigerant has to keep going so there is a constant cycle of heat that is being captured released captured be released so steps 1 to 4 are continuously being repeated how is this generated or how is this run the flow is driven by electrical pumps heat pumps also contain a variety of sensors that can be used to optimize the operation of the device. Valves and other components within the heat pumps can be controlled by electronic connected electronics connected to those sensors to improve heat output or reduce your electricity consumption. Electrical pumps are used so it needs a power connection and this heat pump has many sensors which can be controlled by electronics and you can improve the heat output or reduce the electricity consumption as well now through all of this you know these four steps that we spoke about we spoke about the technical nature we spoke about the science behind it why is this important firstly to understand the company secondly to understand the product that the company is making and thirdly we can see that this is a very technical process getting the manufacturing right with quality and safety is very important for domestic products so the input and manufacturing process will have to be controlled carefully do you think a good product can be made if you don't have good suppliers if you don't have good input and as a manufacturing organization controlling your input is quite important is quite should be given importance let put let's put it that way so the concept of supply chain management can be kept in mind here along with the principles of total quality management there can be no lapse in quality otherwise it can be unpleasant for the homeowner and it can be a reputational damage for your business so we're speaking about supply chain management we're speaking about over here the opportunity of total quality management part of your e3 syllabus that we have spoken about now specifically heat pumps in central heating systems up until now a generic use of heat pumps was explained heat pumps are used in air conditioning in refrigerators and in central heating so up until now general knowledge of how heat pumps work was being given to you now heat pumps in central heating system specifically heat pumps are alternative to boilers as heat sources for central heating systems there is direct op uh, alternative or direct substitute a heat pumps evaporator can be located outside of the building where it will capture heat energy even during cold weather that's the technology it has to capture heat energy the condenser and expansion valve are located inside the house with pipes installed through the wall to carry the refrigerant around the system. So a network of pipes will still be present and a diagram has been put for you to what a heat pump looks like outside the house. I've put a picture. Some heat pumps can reverse the flow of heat as well. Another technology that's available is that some heat pumps can reverse the flow of heat as well which means that they can be used to heat a building during winter and cool it in summer that is potentially attractive to customers that are in countries that have wide temperature variations between seasons winters are very cold summers are very hot so you'll need this kind of a system right and this was also a technological innovation now, technological innovation leads to, leads to opportunities as well as threats. This is one example of an opportunity arising because of a new technological investment, a new product development, a new product advancement. And as we have learned in the industry analysis as well, the nature of this industry is one that where to stay ahead, you will have to invest, invest in research, have to invest in development. So again, when we go to the when we go to start to speak about our company, remember we have not started to speak about our company. We are only speaking about background up until now. When we start to speak about our company, 
we'll try to see the products that our company offers because only then you will be able to understand what can your company do what could your company do what should your company do very important to understand is that heat pumps do not need electricity to create heat energy so to create that heat energy they don't need electricity but they depend on a number of electrical components in their operation like the electrical pumps that we spoke about so those electric pumps those sensors they will require electricity not electricity is not needed to generate heat these include the compressor the circulator pump used to maintain the flow of refrigerant and fans or pumps that help with the circulation of air or water around the evaporator and condenser so it uses electricity overall but it doesn't use electricity to create heat energy no that heat energy is captured from the environment but to make the components run electricity is needed in cold climates it may also be necessary to use electricity to heat mechanisms located outdoors to prevent them from icing up now if you don't have a mechanism to heat the uh, you know to heat the heat pump that is located outside the house it might gather snow it might ice up by itself so electricity is used if you are using a heat pump it's as simple as that that's what you have to know heat pumps cost less to run than traditional boilers so they cost less to run despite their need to consume electrical powers typically a heat pump can deliver 3 kilowatts of heat energy for every kilowatt of electricity consumed so the output is good and it consumes less uh, you know it's it's more cost effective to run let me put it that way than a boiler unfortunately heat pumps cost more to buy and install that's why you don't see them everywhere it's a very sophisticated technology that we learnt about and so obviously it's going to be expensive as well sophisticated technology does not come cheap right so this is consistent with the information in the industry analysis we must keep in mind the strategies used by competitors which we have mentioned in the industry analysis that deal with innovation that deal with making it more sustainable that making it more affordable available to everybody to have a larger market share so why don't you see them everywhere because they are they may be uh, they may cost less to run but the installation cost is quite high an air source heat pump that my company hot air manufactures will cost five times more than an equivalent gas boiler and a ground source heat pump can be even more expensive so air source is five times more than a gas boiler and a ground source heat pump we are going to speak about both types later on can be even more expensive heat pumps capture heat energy from the environment that is supplied by the sun there is no combustion and no carbon emission that's one of the major marketing points that's one of the major pros of this heat uh, heat generating system care must be taken in the installation maintenance and replacement of heat pumps to ensure that the refrigerant is not accidentally released because at the end of the day it's a chemical refrigerants harm the environment by causing global warming if they are allowed to escape into the atmosphere it is however possible to drain the refrigerant from old heat pumps into seal tanks for reuse or safe disposal so over here you'll see it's a very focused market because not everybody will be able to afford this right so customer segmentation and understanding the perspective sustainability mindset of the customer using this equipment is going to be very important because if the customer is not ready to spend does not understand the benefits and does not understand the environmental benefits that this heat pump generates is he going to splurge that huge amount of money i don't think so so segmentation of your customers and focus on your customers will be important the more market analysis we do and use technology to support us the better we can serve this market 
This brings in the concept of data analysis, big data, customer segmentation that we will speak with an example deeper into the pre-scene. But right now just giving you an idea and this is part of our E3 syllabus. Heat pumps can capture energy from outside in almost any weather. Although they become less efficient at lower temperatures, but they can still capture the heat energy from outside. Because even if it's snowing, there are some days when there is a sun and there is heat energy still in the environment which it captures. In, that's the technology. So in practice, a heat pump can supply a central heating system with sufficient heat energy when outside temperatures are as low as minus 15 degrees Celsius. That is rarely a problem in many countries, including Norland, because it is seldom that cold. So heat pumps become a little less efficient at lower temperatures. So our target market is further narrowed because of the nature of the product and its efficiency. It can only be marketed, it can only be used in areas where it's not excessively cold. Technical knowledge will be key for our industry, along with the zest to always innovate, to always make it easier for end users, to always make it more sustainable, becomes part of my E3 syllabus, customer understanding, customer segmentation, market analysis is a very important focus in this market. Air source heat, heat pumps collect heat energy from the air as it passes over the evaporator. This is the simplest type of heat pump for use in heating systems and is the most popular. That's what we manufacture. Our company, Hot Air, manufactures air source heat pumps. That's been told to us in the first page. The evaporator is enclosed in a housing. You see an example image has been put here. Along with a fan that draws air into the apparatus. The condenser and the other components are enclosed in another housing that is inside the house. On inside a casing, there will be the evaporator outside of the house. Inside the house, there will also be a casing where there will be a condenser and other components. And it is connected to the central heating and hot water systems. Refrigerant flows between the interior and exterior housings using the pipes that run through the wall. So your outside evaporator is connected to the condenser and the other components through pipes. Air source heat pumps have the drawback of being exposed to variable air temperatures which change with the weather and so affects their efficiency. They are however relatively easy to install. The interiors, the interior workings of a heat pump that is being installed in place of a gas boiler can be fitted in place of the boiler that is to be removed. So remove the boiler, put the heat pump. It's as simple as that interior wise. So it's not huge hassle to, you know, go through the entire setup process. No, it's expensive. But yes, the, the setup is easy. The exterior housing also remains accessible for any repairs in the event of a breakdown or leak. Now this is the product that your company manufactures. So understand this. There is air source. And there is ground source as well, which is an alternative to air source. The ground source use the same principles, except that the evaporator is placed under the ground or is submerged in a body of water. So rather than having something like this, this image that you see, it's the, uh, the evaporator is placed underground or submerged in a body of water. The system remains the same. And I've put a diagram for you again over here, which is part of the pre-scene. The temperature around the evaporator is less severely affected by changing weather conditions. So it's more efficient than the air source equivalent. It's underground, right? So less changes in weather conditions. So it becomes more efficient than the air source equivalent. The need to bury the evaporator can complicate the installation. If I already have a house and I don't have any place to dig and then bury the evaporator, it's no use of this ground source method or machine. So that is why air source is more popular. And that is why, uh, you know, maybe our company has chosen to make air source heat pumps. It's 
more popular, easily accessible, easily can put it. The evaporator must be several feet below the ground in order to capture the heat energy efficiently and also to be protected from damage. So there's a clear drawback here of this system. It's more efficient in heating, but there's a drawback. Ground source heat pumps require the same equipment to be installed inside the house at the air source. But the only difference is outside. Where in ground source, it's in the ground. In air source, it's like a big machine in a casing outside the house. Inside, everything is the same. Now, one disadvantage of all heat pumps, both air source and ground source, is that they produce hot water that is cooler than the water from a boiler. You can't get the same effect of a boiler. It's as simple as that. The difference is roughly 10 degrees for air source heat pumps, little less for ground source, but it will be cooler than a boiler. The boiler will give you hot steaming water. If that's something that you want, then you'll have to get a boiler. In either case, that can mean that a central heating system based on a heat pump will struggle to raise the room temperature to a comfortable level. It might not be enough. Even inside the house, you may need to wear a jacket. You may need to wear full clothes because it may not be that efficient. That problem can be solved by using larger radiators than for a traditional boiler based system or by installing underfloor heating when installing a heat pump. So you can, you know, move this disadvantage away if you have larger radiators, more radiators, or if you have an underfloor heating system more steam will be needed to be able to successfully heat the home. That's one disadvantage again. Either option will provide a large surface area for transfer of heat, although the cost of doing so would discourage many homeowners. Again, larger, uh, you know, radiators, more cost. Underfloor heating, more cost. So radiators, them, uh, the heat pumps themselves are expensive. But by using larger radiators and underfloor pump, uh, piping and pumping, you are going to increase the cost further, becoming further inaccessible by the general population. So your market is getting very much saturated over here. It is easier to install heating systems based on heat pumps in new homes because they can be built from the very beginning with large radiators or underfloor heating pipes in place. We've spoken about the benefits and we've spoken about the drawbacks of this system both. For different countries, this market will have different prospects. Every country will not be able to accept this kind of cost. Domestic heating equipment can be considered as a relatively recent development in developing nations which still have growth opportunities. Understanding when, where, how to compete will be an important decision for our company. And when deciding on expansion strategies, these facts need to be kept in mind. And like I mentioned before, the ANSOFS matrix can be used here, which is part of your E3 syllabus. So that brings us to the end of part one of our pre-scene analysis. And I'm going to do a lot more discussion in part two relating to risk management, relating to government in, uh, intervention, interference, and a lot of other risk management discussions. Then a lot of financial risk uh, discussions as we go to the financials. So this entire pre-scene analysis that we have created is close to three hours long. You're just viewing the first hour here as the first part because we like to break it down and not make it one large recording for all of our students. So all of our students who sign up with us also receive two part recordings to make sure that it's not one huge recording where they're missing out on important information or important areas. We don't want that. So that has brought us to the end of part one of the pre-scene analysis. If you found it helpful and if you found my explanations helpful, you can sign up to one of our courses on the SCS page. Just go to fintutors.com forward slash SCS or you can go to fintutors, click the courses option and scroll down to the SCS page. 
That's where you'll find the different study options. Or you can write to us on help at the rate fintutors.com and we'll help you out with any information that you need. So that's all from me. I hope you found part one helpful. Thank you.